Hello dear students, welcome to Biology Decrypted. This series of Biochemistry Decrypted is going on and six lectures have been covered so far. If you haven't watched the previous lectures yet, well, you'll find the links to all those lectures. Those have been compiled uh, in a playlist and you'll find the link to the playlist in the I button. So please check out the playlist, watch all the lectures and then come to this lecture. And this is lecture seven. Lecture seven, peptide bond, peptides and polypeptides. So our discussion is regarding this important topic and we'll be learning to solve many kind of questions as well in this particular session. Without further delay, let's start. So if you talk about amino acids, you now know the structures of all the 20 different amino acids. Now these amino acids are basically monomers. Just like if you have beads, you can actually, uh, you can, you can arrange those beads on a string and you can add more beads and you can make a polymer kind of a thing. You can make a necklace kind of a thing in a similar way, amino acids, which behave as monomers, they can be considered as beads. Let's say you have n number of monomers n can be anything n can be any number apart from zero, of course. So when these monomers, these amino acids, they undergo polymerization. Then what you see is polymers are formed. Polymers are formed in this way where all these beads are joined via certain bonds. All these beads are joined via certain bonds and you can say there will be n number of n number of monomers in this particular polymer. Now there can be different types of polymers. Polymers, when we talk about polymers, we are talking about a general term. We are not specifically talking about amino acids. Well, there can be polymers of sugars, which are called as polysaccharides. There can be polymers of nucleotides, which can be called as polynucleotides or nucleic acids. So if you talk in a very general sense, if you talk about the basic chemistry of polymerization, what we see is something like this. In a very general sense, like from chemistry point of view, polymerization can be classif classified as addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. Addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. Well, we are not concerned about addition polymerization here because uh, this process is, it follows a free radical mechanism and it is generally uh, observed when we are making synthetic polymers. But in case of biological systems, what we find most commonly is condensation polymerization and in condensation polymerization, specifically what happens, what we see in most of the cases is removal of water takes place. Obviously, condensation does not always mean removal of water, but yes, uh, removal of some molecule. If you talk in a general sense, it's removal of some molecule, but here specifically the bonds we will be talking about, we are talking about removal of water. Now, if you talk about examples, if you talk about examples, well, we can consider the bonding between alcohol and alcohol. There is one alcohol molecule another alcohol molecule and finally what they are forming is nothing but an ether bond. For example, if you have ROH, this is your first alcohol and then you are having another alcohol that is R-OH. Now what you will do is you will try to remove water from this obviously from one alcohol OH will be released from the other H will be released. So it's very simple. You can either do it this way like H and OH from here, or you can say OH and H from here. Obviously the mechanism is not that easy. The overall mechanism is lengthy. It is complicated, but here we are not talking about the mechanism. We are not talking about the mechanism of removal of water. We'll just simply talk about this bond formation in general. So now what we can say is what we can say is let's say, uh, this is this bond. This bond is called an ether bond. So this is an ether bond. Now, if we try to specify, if we try to specify that 
let this alcohol group belong to sugars so yes this will be one sugar this will be another sugar so if we talk about sugar we are basically talking about monosaccharides so we know that monosaccharides or sugars uh, they are uh, these carbohydrates are polyhydroxyaldehydes or polyhydroxy ketones they are th there are more than one oh groups and therefore there can be formation of these kind of ether bonds because they also have alcoholic groups so what they form is whenever we are talking specifically about sugars which obviously have alcoholic groups which obviously have oh groups they will lead the formation of glycosidic bonds they will form glycosidic bonds now obviously this process involved removal of water removal of water now if you talk about now if we talk about a carboxylic acid and we talk about an amine fine so there is a carboxylic acid and an amine let's say amine now here this is the structure of carboxylic acid and this is the structure of amine so what we can do here is we can write nh2 like this there is this nitrogen and there is this r dash let's say r dash now what will happen is water will get removed and you should remember that water is removed in this way h from nitrogen and oh from acid it's not the other way around well do not confuse it with the removal of h plus ions yes h plus ions is a separate issue but here we are primarily concerned with the removal of both the atoms and if you actually carry out uh, like radioactive labeling labeling based studies what you will find is this oxygen is also found in the water that is removed and that is how it was verified that it's the o and h of carboxylic acid and it's just the h of amine so this is very important so what we'll do is we'll try to encircle this and this is how water is removed this is how water is removed so now what will happen is water is removed and what you finally get is r c double bond o n h r dash well now we come to an important bond what is this bond known as this bond is known as no it's not the peptide bond because i have shown a normal carboxylic acid and amine and this bond is therefore not a peptide bond this is an amide bond now let us consider a case let's say if this carboxylic acid group belong to an amino acid and this one belong like let's say amino acid one and this nh2 this nh2 for example belonged to amino acid number two only in that case only in that case again there would there would have been removal of water and in that case after the removal of water the bond which would have been formed obviously it would be a conh bond only but the bond in that case would have been called as a peptide bond this is an important point to note so what you get here is amino acid 1 then there is the conh bond and then there is amino acid 2 and this is how a peptide bond is formed because two amino acids are being linked by a covalent bond that is your peptide bond that is your peptide bond so this is how a peptide bond is formed and in this case specifically in this case we call it a peptide bond now is there any difference between amide bonds and peptide bonds well uh, yes you haven't thought so but let me tell you there is a fundamental difference there is a fundamental difference so what is this difference basically if we try to represent it through venn diagrams this is how we'll represent it here i am talking about all the amide bonds and here i am talking about all the peptide bonds well this circle in red represents the peptide bonds and obviously the circle in white represents the amide bonds now what there, there's a statement that we can make here what we can say is all peptide bonds 
all peptide bonds are amide bonds but not vice versa so what we can say is but all but all amide bonds are not peptide bonds so what we can say here is uh, like we don't even need to write this statement because it's self explanatory from here from this venn diagram itself that see all peptide bonds lie in the region of amide bonds so yes all peptide bonds are amide bonds but these amide bonds are not coming under peptide so not all amide bonds are peptide bonds some can be but some are not so this is the overall concept of polymerization and how this peptide bond is formed now well let's talk more about the peptide bond so if we take an amino acid this is amino acid number 1 then there will be amino acid number 2 then what will happen is there is a bond for, formed which we have already seen c o n h this is your peptide bond this is your peptide bond an amide bond that is specifically found specifically found in peptides in proteins so yes this is known as a peptide bond and what happened is in the year 1902 in the year 1902 emil fisher emil fisher and franz hofmeister these two famous scientists they actually characterized this peptide bond they characterized this peptide bond and obviously this is your peptide bond this is your peptide bond now what happens here basically in the formation of this peptide bond an important thing happens and uh, yes this is how you can show it this is how you can basically show it that there is this alpha amino acid number one then there is this alpha amino acid number two right what will happen is we'll see the formation of this formation will take place and how will this formation take place obviously by removal or elimination of water so here elimination of water will take place now after the elimination of water after the elimination of water if we try to represent amino acid number one and amino acid number two this is how we'll represent this amino acid number one and amino acid number two and obviously if we try to draw the structures like this this is r1 this is h this is nh3 plus here we'll draw the structures in expanded form and let's consider the zwitter and ionic form let's consider for once the zwitter ionic form here now here we'll draw r2 n h h h with a positive charge nh3 plus and coo minus and this is H again. Now what we see here is very important. What we can see here is very important. This is the group that will get removed from here. And these two are the groups. These two are the groups that will get removed from here. And overall from this, like this is how it is represented in standard books. This is how water is removed. This is how elimination of water takes place and as a result the bond which is formed is a peptide bond and this is how the bond looks like so here after removal of water this is how they get joined r1 ns3 plus h c double bond o n h then the remaining structure r2 h c o o minus this is how we draw the structure and this is how we can see that this peptide bond is formed this can be another way of representing it this can be another way of representing it obviously this part this part was already there this is the hydrogen this part was already there and yes this is how it is this is how it is the peptide bond moving forward let's move forward let's talk about more important things well can we actually figure out a logical mechanism for this yes we can logical mechanism 
because mechanisms are something that are not fixed well yes books do propose mechanisms but those are proposed mechanisms nobody has actually seen it how it is happening so this is somehow you are trying to explain the story this is your way of explanation of the story explanation of the products that are formed from given reactants so that's how you actually cook up a story uh, based on your observations and this uh, you can actually talk about uh, mechanisms in that way so uh, let's talk about the mechanism for this process of formation of peptide bond So yes, this is the logical mechanism that we'll talk about. First, R1, NH2, C double bond O, H. Now, as we know, uh, yes, there is H here. Similarly, here we have amino acid number two, and this has a structure like this: R2, C double bond O H. and H here. Now, this one has a lone pair. Let me tell you about a few things. Here you can see this bond is actually polar. This bond is polar. Here it has a partial positive charge. The carbon has a partial, partial positive charge and oxygen has a partial negative charge. So obviously, if this nucleophile will get attack here, this will go here. And then as a result, this will get joined. And since it is giving away its lone pair, Therefore, after donating the lone pair, it will have a net positive charge when it is bonded already, when it is already bonded to this. Wait, let me show you. If it is already bonded to this, then it will actually give its lone pair and it will have a positive charge. Let's see it, what's happening. So basically, this nitrogen is making an attack on this particular carbon and this one has a delta positive, this one has a delta negative. Now, since there is an attack here, what is happening is, from this, we are getting R1, NH2, H, C, then there is this O minus. Since these pi electrons went here, so obviously there will be a negative charge. So this, this, these will be the lone pairs. So yes, this comes with a negative charge. And now, here we can say, uh, this, uh, we can say that this OH is there. This OH is there. And what we can say is simultaneously what happened, simultaneously what happened, this OH actually got protonated as well. This OH took up a proton and let's say this has actually formed this HOH positive. And as you can see here, this will obviously be more happier if it actually leaves as a water molecule. So it's a leaving group. It's a very good leaving group because it will form a stable compound after leaving this. So what will happen here is very important. We'll just see it. Similarly, this nitrogen has given its, like it has formed a bond with this lone pair and therefore, therefore, this will have a positive charge. And yes, both these hydrogens will be attached here. Then what we can say is here we have R2, here we have H and here we have COOH. Now what will happen? Now what will happen is something very important to notice. This group will be removed as water. Similarly, this will come back as a double bond. Here, a molecule of water will actually try to abstract this proton and this will give away its electrons to the nitrogen. Let's sum up what happened. First, this came as a double bond. Simultaneously, this left as water molecule. A water molecule came with its lone pair. It took away a proton and after it took away a proton, the electrons actually fell on this nitrogen and this nitrogen got back its lone pair and as a result the product which is formed is something like this let's draw it here we have r1 nh2 h c double bond o here we have n h here we have r2 h and c double bond o h this is the overall structure this is the overall structure and this is how we saw we actually proposed a mechanism for the formation of peptide bond and this can happen this can uh, happen for many 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 peptides many 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 amino acids many many amino acids can join and this is how this whole process will proceed this whole thing will proceed 
So every time a new amino acid comes, obviously the attack will be from NH2 to, to the carboxylic acid group. So obviously the bonds are formed in N to C direction, from N to C direction. It's very, very important. This is how this process actually occurs. Now, 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 now. let's talk about a few important concepts. Let's talk, let's talk about peptides in general. Well, based on like, if you try to classify peptides, obviously what are peptides? Peptides are, peptides are structures that are formed after combination, like after polymerization of amino acids. Well, there can be just two amino acids which can form a dipeptide. There can be three amino acids which can form a tripeptide. There can be four amino acids which can be tetrapeptide. Well, there can be more than 10, like let's say hundreds or thousands of amino acids in a peptide. In that case, that will be called as a polypeptide. So, peptides can be classified as peptides. If the number of residues, like this will completely depend on the number of residues, number of amino acid residues. Based on the number of amino acid residues, what we can say is if the number of amino acid residues, if the number of amino acid residues is 2, in that case, we'll have a dipeptide. Two, two amino acids linked by a peptide bond. It will have in one NH3 group free and one uh, one CO minus group free, obviously. So yes. Now moving forward, if amino acid number of amino acids is three, then in that case we'll call it as a tripeptide. We'll call it as a tripeptide. Now, if the number of amino acids is four, it will be called as a tetrapeptide, pentapeptide, hexapeptide, and so on. You can easily make it out from the name if you are given the name like if you're given the number you can obviously think about the name now if we talk about 3 to 10 amino acid residues or let's say uh not just 3 to 10 even if it is uh, at times even if it is like approximately up to uh, 20 or 30 it is sometimes classified uh, under the heading of oligopeptides well but yes in a general manner we can say from 3 to 10 these can be considered as oligopeptides. These are oligopeptides. So yes, these are also types of peptides. So this is how we talked about oligopeptides. If there are, in general, if there are 3 to 10 amino acid residues in some classifications, it is also said that uh, more than more than 10, that is sometimes 20 or 30 or 40, let's say up to 40 residues, they are also considered uh, by some books as oligopeptides. Now, if we talk about if we talk about polypeptides obviously the last category is the last classification is of polypeptides now if you talk about polypeptides the the range can be from 40 so yes some books also say it is up to 40 or let's say less than 40 less than 40 that is considered as oligopeptides now if it is approximately 40 or more than 40 and it can range up to a maximum of 34,000. It can range up to a maximum of 34,000 amino acid residues. In that case, like there can be different examples. There can be hundreds, there can be th thousands, there can be hundreds or thousands of amino acids. So if there are 40 to 34,000, like 34,000 is the maximum limit. Although if we actually uh, like talking uh, talk in a real sense, what we can say is approximately 1500 amino acids, like approximately 1500 amino acid residues are mostly like this is mostly in most cases, in most cases, this is the maximum limit. It doesn't go beyond that. In some rare cases, yes, it can up to 34,000 amino acids. Now, so this was the overall classification of peptides. We talked about dipeptides, tripeptides, tetrapeptides. In general, the concept about 
oligopeptides and then finally we came to polypeptides and now we know what type of peptides actually exist moving forward moving forward let's talk about amino acid versus amino acid residues well i talked about a term i mentioned a term called residues what does this word residue mean well whenever you burn something actually water evaporates and whatever is left behind is known as a residue well we'll talk about the same thing here but in a different sense yes it does re uh, involve the removal of water but yes we are not actually heating it so uh, if you talk about a free amino acid if you try to compare a free amino acid versus an amino acid residue this is a very important comparison and this concept should be clear in your mind so amino acid residues whenever we talk about amino acid residues we actually talk about polypeptides or simply peptides because why is it called so because in the case of a free amino acid, if you try to draw the structure of a general free amino acid, there will be this alpha carbon, there will be CO minus, we are trying to draw a zwitterionic form. So we have alpha amino group, NH3 plus, and here we have H, here we have R. Now what we can see here, now what we can see here is this particular group and this particular group. Both these groups are free, like this. Both my hands are free. Let's consider this one is NH3 plus, this one is CO minus, and we can say, see, I have both hands free and I am a free amino acid. Yes, uh, you can imagine me as an amino acid. So, yes, two hands, two legs, and basically I have four groups. I have four groups, and yes, two of my groups are free. Well, two are at top and bottom. For example, if my legs are like this and my hands are like this if i am doing this kind of a complicated yoga this is how i can do it so yes these are my two hands and these are my two legs so this is how i am making a structure this is how i am trying to lie down this is very very complicated but yes i hope you can understand that if these two groups are actually bonded i won't have free hands i will in fact this will be shared by someone this will be shared by someone and this is how this is how overall like this was a very uh, vague idea of explaining it like this is how if there are free amino groups and there are free carboxylic groups obviously this H group and R group is common but this NH3 plus group and this CO minus group is very important and if it is actually involved in bonding then this won't be free and obviously during this formation obviously there will be for every peptide bond for every peptide bond there will be removal of one water molecule and since there is removal of water molecule and whatever is remaining is being called as a residue so this is the overall concept of amino acid residues let's consider a dipeptide here let's consider a dipeptide here for simplicity so there is this amino acid one now this is actually this amino acid one as a COOH group now this will obviously form a CONH group now there will be this particular amino acid this central amino acid which had a free amino group initially which had a free amino group initially but then what happened it actually got bonded to this left amino acid that is amino acid number one so let's make a tripeptide here let's say now here what we see is this is actually the amino acid the amino acid number two we can say this is alpha carbon this has this r group then this has then this has this c double bond o this has this c double bond o oh and there is water molecule that is removed and this peptide bond is formed and this is formed with amino acid number three this is formed with amino acid number three so we can see here that there are two peptide bonds involved there are two peptide bonds involved and here you can see that this this particular amino acid that is our amino acid number two this is the part of this amino acid this whole thing is the part of this particular amino acid like this co group this NH group and this whole thing this whole thing is a part of 
this amino acid and this is your amino acid number two. What you can see here is if you actually try to compare the molecular weight, there will be a difference of the molecular weight of one water molecule because there will be one water molecule in this formation. In this formation, one water molecule will be lost. And in this peptide bond formation, one water molecule will be lost. So for this, on an average, we can say that this cannot be called as a free amino acid. This is basically a residue which actually has both its ends, the amino end and the carboxyl end bonded. So this is very important. Let's compare it. Here we can find free, free alpha amino and free alpha carboxylic acid group, alpha carboxylate groups. And what we can see here is this used to be an alpha amino group before the peptide bond formation. This used to be an alpha carboxylate group. So this is alpha amino and alpha carboxylate, alpha amino and alpha carboxylate groups. They are basically involved. They are involved in peptide bonds. They are involved in peptide bonds. Now let's move forward. Let's move forward. Let's let's talk more about polypeptides. Now, if you talk about the structure of polypeptides, we know that there will be multiple residues. Let's say there are n residues. Let's say there are, there are n residues and we are just talking about the general structure of polypeptides. So what we can say is polypeptides can either be linear. They can either be linear. And what we say is mostly mostly polypeptides are linear like the polypeptides found in nature mostly they are linear some can be circular or cyclic so the next category is circular polypeptide or we can say cyclic polypeptide this is how we can actually classify polypeptides now if i ask you a question is branching found in case of polypeptides well, the clear cut answer is no. Branching is not found in case of polypeptides. Why? Why? Well, think about it. If you talk about sugars, sugars have multiple groups like they have OH, OH, OH. They have OH throughout. They have OH throughout. Actually, if you try to draw the structure like this, for example, here. OH here, OH here, OH here, then there is CH2, OH here. So there are multiple groups with OH. There, is, there are multiple groups with OH. And obviously bonding can be formed between any of these. Bonding can be formed between any of these. Precisely it is formed between either 1 and 4 or you can say 1 and 6. So this is the, this is the overall uh, condition for sugars. In that case, yes, finding branching is very common. But if you talk about, if you talk about polypeptides or let's say if you talk about nucleic acids in both these cases actually the bond forming group is attached linearly it is actually forming a bond in a linear fashion and there is no other functional group that can form a bond like this through branching so obviously it lacks the presence of branching there are no branches in case of polypeptides these are either linear or they can be circular or we can call circular as cyclic as well. Now, let's look at each of these structures one by one. So, if we talk about linear polypeptides, what we will see here is this is how the amino acids are present. They are linked via peptide bonds and this is how there are, let's say, n such residues in this particular polypeptide. Now, as you can see, these bonds are basically the peptide bonds, which we have represented in this manner. But actually, if you try to see this bond will be like this. This is the peptide bond that is present here. Now, if we try to express any kind of linear 
polypeptide we should actually draw the ends as well for example this is an this this is uh, this is a linear polypeptide chain which i have showed with uh, let's say n residues and we can say there are many many residues let's say thousands of residues are there but yes obviously the chain will be finite it won't be infinite right so if we try to draw a finite chain this is an uh, this is an octapeptide as you can see there are eight residues here so there will be coo minus at the right most end and this particular end ends are also called as terminus terminus or termini so this this part is free obviously for this this uh, this co minus is free for the uh, last residue right for example if there are if this is residue number one two three four five six seven and eight the eighth residue has this coo minus free obviously this is free and this is known as the c terminus so any kind of polypeptide will always have a c terminus and this c terminus is also called as the carboxyl terminus this is the carboxyl terminus now if we talk about the leftmost amino acid that is the first one this has a free nh3 plus group it has a free nh3 plus group and this group this terminus this end is called as the end terminus this is called as the end terminus and the end terminus here is also free and obviously this is the amino terminus so there is an amino terminus and there is a carboxyl terminus and this is how we represent any kind of linear polypeptide now if we talk about circular or cyclic polypeptides well representing these circular or cyclic polypeptides is actually easy what will happen is this one for example this linear polypeptide in this end you can see that there is this nh3 plus group present in this part you can see that at the end you can see that there is the co minus group present well what will happen in the circular or cyclic polypeptide is this end and this end this will come closer there will be a removal of water molecule and another peptide bond is formed here another peptide bond is formed here and as a result this becomes circular this becomes cyclic and the structure will somewhat look like this this is how we'll draw the structure of an octapeptide that is cyclic here we'll see that there are no free n and c terminus because this is already engaged in a peptide bond so this is the basic concept of linear and circular or cyclic uh, let's say cyclic polypeptides now is there a relation between nucleic acids and polypeptides well because we know that nucleic acids for example there is dna now as we know as per the central dogma as per the central dogma dna gets converted into mrna and then this mrna forms proteins initially polypeptides so during this process what we should remember is well there is an important connection here these polypeptides these are polymers it's very obvious similarly nucleic acids dna rna etc they are also polymers and obviously polymers are composed of monomers what are the monomers in case of nucleic acids well you will say it's very easy the monomers are monomers are 
न्यूक्लियोटाइड्स न्यूक्लियोटाइड्स आर द मोनोमर्स हियर वेयर एज इफ यू टॉक अबाउट द मोनोमर्स हियर द मोनोमर्स आर अमाइनो एसिड्स दीज आर द मोनोमर्स नाउ इज देर अ रिलेशन बिटवीन द टू इज देर अ रिलेशन बिटवीन द टू वेल ऑब्वियसली येस देर इज अ रिलेशन If we talk about DNA, let's say if we talk about DNA in a, I have drawn it in a linear form, five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime. This is DNA. Now, DNA has a certain number of base pairs. For example, this is this is a base. This 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 is where you have the bases, and these bases are forming base pairs. This is how we can say. So this is one base, and this thing is known as a base pair. this is known as a base pair and now what we can say is actually if we look at the mrna the mrna which is formed from dna this is also from 5 prime to 3 prime and here what we see generally this mrna is red this is translated by ribosomes into polypeptides so what we see here is in this process transcription is involved in this process this process is called as translation and then finally what is formed is a polypeptide now what happens is if you know basics of molecular biology what happens is like even if you have studied it till class 12 uh, you can say that there is a trna which is represented generally by a clover leaf structure this trna basically brings an amino acid and it has three it has three bases if we look at this part what we can say is in this part you can say here 1 2 and 3 here we have 1 2 and 3 for example if we have a u g here for example if we have a u g here what we will have here is u a and c we will have u a and c so what we can see here that it is recognizing it is recognizing in the form of triplets so what we can see here is this is basically this is after all leading to the formation of this one amino acid so for this this thing is called this whole thing is called the, obviously there are three nucleotides involved three nucleotides so for three nucleotides or we can say three base pairs we are getting one amino acid this is the basic math three nucleotides correspond to one amino acid now since each trna it carries one amino acid this is how simultaneously amino acids are added inside by the ribosome there is this peptidyl transferase activity due to which new bonds are catalyzed peptide bonds are formed and then finally this chain elongates now what we can say here is uh, this is a very important concept what happens here is since three nucleotides lead the formation of one amino acid and if you talk about an mrna obviously there will be a stop codon so these are three these are called codons and codons are triplets these are triplets codon these are triplet codons so what we can say for example if if you are given a question let's say if you are given a question that there are for example there are 999 let's say there are 999 base pairs and now what we see here is there are 999 base pairs how many amino acids will be formed how many amino acids will be formed so you can you can say let's see in this open reading frame in this particular open reading frame of this mrna what we see here is there will be a stop codon at last so how we can actually distribute it we can say that this is 996 plus 3 these three these three base pairs actually correspond to the stop codon and this does not code any amino acid this does not code any amino acid whereas 
these 996 will code for amino acids and we know since three of the base pairs they are responsible for one amino acid so if you divide this number by three so what we get this is 332 so this is the number of amino acids in the polypeptide chain this will form a polypeptide chain this will form a polypeptide chain and this is how you get the answer this is how you actually calculate it or else you could have done a simple thing you could actually you could have actually divided it by three and then uh, you would have subtracted one amino acid since uh, the stop codon does not code for any amino acid in this way also this question could have been solved this was very simple moving forward let's move forward now we talk about proteins basic idea of proteins see if you talk about proteins they they may constitute of one or more polypeptide chains we can have one or more polypeptide chains let's say if we have a protein it might have let's say four polypeptide chains here so this is the whole protein and these are the polypeptide chains right but yes it can also happen that if you are talking about protein we are also talking about the polypeptide so if there is just one one polypeptide chain and protein is made up of if there is one protein and it is equal to one polypeptide chain like it is comprised of one polypeptide chain so in that case the polypeptide is the protein polypeptide forms the protein or there can be a different case there can be different cases where there can be more than one for example if we talk about hemoglobin so yes in case of hemoglobin what we can say here is we have four polypeptide chains four polypeptide chains and this is the protein so protein comprises of four polypeptide chains so there can be different scenarios well all proteins have polypeptides but not all polypeptides not all, all polypeptides can singly form proteins. There may be multiple units of these polypeptide chains required to form quaternary structures of proteins. Well, we'll talk about protein structural hierarchy in some other class. As of now, let's, let's once again talk about peptide bond formation, about the energetics aspect. So if we talk about peptide bond formation, well, we can simply draw the structures quickly. This is R1, this is H, this is NH2, this is COOH. Then we have another amino acid, NH2, H, R2, and COOH. Now, what happens is in this process, in this process, water is released, water is eliminated, water is removed, however you say. This process is essentially a process of dehydration. Basically, water is being released. It's it can be called as condensation but yes it is uh, chemically it is dehydration it's removal of water and what is formed is this structure h c o h r2 r1 nh2 h now here the bond that is formed is c o n h the bond that is formed here is c o n h and this is a peptide bond obviously the water is removed between this and this so this leads the release of water now if you talk about the energetics so this is amino acid one and this is amino acid two now for this for this what we can say is the delta g values the standard standard gives free energy for this process so uh, standard gives free energy for peptide bond formation is plus 21 kilojoule per mole plus 21 kilojoule per mole and now this process as you can see this is unfavorable since this is positive delta g value is positive and therefore this process can be called as an endergonic process this process is an endergonic process and endergonic process means this process is non-spontaneous which means it does not happen on its own actually it has to be 
coupled with some other reaction some other reaction which has a huge amount of net free energy and therefore it is coupled with atp hydrolysis which makes the net value negative and which makes delta g negative and then this process is possible so overall atp hydrolysis it actually releases a lot of energy and due to this release of lot of energy there is lots of energy available even after the hydrolysis of atp of even after the breaking of the phos uh, phosphoanhydride bond and then finally what happens is uh, this this overall this leads to a net negative delta g and this net negative delta g actually overpowers uh, that of the requirement of peptide bond formation and makes it slightly negative and therefore it finally this this uh, reaction finally occurs so this is how it is made feasible thermodynamically now let's move forward let's talk about different amino acids and their molecular weights so i'll give you a table and also i'll tell you about their average percentage occurrence so we'll actually see it for all the 20 amino acids so here what we can see is in this list we can see that different amino acids are given their molecular weight is given and their average percentage occurrence is given in case of proteins like in proteins uh, how often do they occur so yes amino acids molecular weight and average percentage occurrence now if we see it for glycine molecular weight is 75 obviously this is in daltons or gram per mole because molecular weight is generally measured in gram per mole how much does one mole of the substance weigh so yes gram per mole or dalton so it's 75 for glycine and the percentage occurrence uh, is given here 7.1 for alanine it is 89 and 8.3 for valine it's 117 6.9 for leucine it's 131 9.7 isoleucine it's 131 6.0 for methionine it's 149 2.4 for tryptophan it is 204 and 1.1 for phenylalanine, for phenylalanine, it's 165 and 3.9. For proline, it's 115 and 4.7. For serine, it's 105 and 6.5. For threonine, it's 119 and 5.3. For for uh, cysteine, it's 121 and 1.4. For tyrosine, it's 181 and 2.9. For asparagine, it's 132 and 4.0. For glutamine it's 146 and 3.9 for aspartate it's 133 and 5.4 for glutamate it's uh, for glutamate it's 147 and 6.8 for arginine it's 7 uh, 174 and 5.5 for lysine it's 146 and 5.9 for histidine it's 155 and 2.3 so these are the values these are all the values now you don't have to buy hard these values well if we try to take an average like if we if we try to multiply this and take an average of all this if we try to take an average if we multiply this by this then add this into this then add this into this this into this this into this we keep on adding and finally if we try to <coughs> actually calculate their abundance out of 100 and then we take out an average for all for all the minus then what we find is we can come to an average molecular weight value we can come to an average molecular weight value and obviously since it depends on the average percentage occurrence or the relative abundance what we will call it is the uh, this this is basically the relative molecular weight we'll talk about relative molecular weight or mr so from this what we can conclude is that we can have an average molecular weight for amino acids so we will have average molecular weight for amino acids and obviously by amino acids i mean free amino acids for this it is 128 daltons for this it is 128 daltons now if you talk if you talk about average molecular weight if we talk about average molecular weight and if we talk about amino acid residues, if we talk about amino acid residues instead of free amino acids, in that particular case, in that particular case, what we see here is there will be loss of one water molecule which is involved, 
एंड सिंस अ वॉटर मॉलिक्यूल वेज एटीन डेल्टन और एटीन ग्राम पर मोल सो वॉट वील डू हियर इज वी विल सब ट्रैक्ट द मॉलिकुलर वेट ऑफ वॉटर फ्रॉम द एवरेज मॉलिकुलर वेट ऑफ अ फ्री अमाइनो एसिड एंड देर फोर द वैल्यू वी गेट फॉर अ रेसिड्यू फॉर एन अमाइनो एसिड रेसिड्यू इज वन वन जीरो इट्स हंड्रेड एंड टेन डेल्टन इट्स हंड्रेड एंड टेन डेल्टन एंड यस दिस इज द एम आर दिस इज द एम आर और दिस कैन बी कॉल्ड एज द रिलेटिव मोलिकुलर वेट दिस इज द रिलेटिव मोलिकुलर वेट ऑफ एनी अमाइनो एसिड रेसिड्यू दिस इज फॉर एनी अमाइनो एसिड रेसिड्यू सो दिस इज अ Average value which uh, we have taken because some have higher molecular weights, some have lower molecular weights. Taking an average with, uh, like, uh, we are also taking into concern their relative abundance or their percentage occurrence in proteins. And finally, we come to a conclusion that it's 110 Dalton for amino acid residues, and for free amino acids, it's 128 Dalton unless specified. And it's very easy if you are being asked about, like, let's say there is an octapeptide, and you have this. Average amino acid uh, residue value as 110. You can just multiply it by 8, and you get the answer. It's 880 Daltons. Similarly, if you are given free amino acids, obviously with a molecular weight of 128 Dalton, uh, let's say there are seven. There, let's say there are seven amino acids which are actually forming peptide bonds. How many peptide bonds will be formed? And as a result, what will be the molecular weight? You will actually multiply it by seven. But yes, you have to remove the water molecules. But how many water molecules will be removed? how many peptide bonds will be formed that will give you the final answer and this is actually very important and you should always remember this so the question arises is how many peptide bonds how many peptide bonds or how many water molecules are removed so this can be a question and obviously it's very obvious each water molecule will correspond to the uh, formation of a peptide bond and therefore obviously the answer will be same here the answer in both the cases will be the same so yes for each uh, i have already told you this that for each h2o molecule released for each h2o molecule released subtract 18 kilo daltons subtract 18 18 dalton sorry so sorry so sorry i just said kilo daltons is actually daltons for what how will you get it in kilo daltons yes you need to take 1000 water molecules for that for 1 kilo uh, for 18 kilo daltons so So sorry, it's actually 18 daltons for each water molecule. You already know this. So this was a this was a small mistake. Uh, now, moving forward, if we talk about to answer this question for peptide bonds as well as for water molecules, the answer will be the same. If we have let's say case one, we have a linear polypeptide. Case two, we have a cyclic polypeptide. Now, for a linear polypeptide, we know that there will be uh, residues like this. and obviously let's consider n residues if there are n residues in a linear polypeptide then we can very easily assume that obviously for 3 see let's let's see this if there are 3 there are two peptide bonds if there are 4 1 2 3 3 peptide bonds so if we have 5 1 2 3 4 so yes there is a relation actually for n we have n minus 1 as simple as that as simple as that for example if you have a rope and you have to make uh, like if you have to make four pieces you will make three cuts three cuts on a rope will actually form four pieces it's as simple as that so this is the logic yes n minus 1 there will be n minus 1 dash peptide bonds water molecules removed the answer is same n minus 1 now for a cyclic polypeptide it is very important to note that it's not n minus 1 here as we can see here that the number of amino acids is equal to the number of peptide bonds see if there are five amino acids five peptide bonds for six there will be six so what we can say here is actually it's 
nothing but n if there are n amino acids if there are n amino acids then it's n n number of peptide bonds n number of water molecules released now let's move to another concept like now we'll finally we are moving towards the end of this particular chapter see peptides if you talk about peptides there can be ribosomal peptides and there can be non ribosomal peptides like ribosomal peptides are actually incorporated by translation where there is an mrna there are ribosomes they are forming this polypeptide chain so this actually occurs by translation and by translation i mean uh, like there is this larger subunit of the ribosome and it has this peptidyl transferase activity which actually forms the peptide bonds but for non ribosomal peptides the process is different this is not via translation also if it is occurring via translation it will be specified by triplet codons we saw this well it's not the case in case of non ribosomal peptides because they do not use the translational machinery for this here we have all the standard amino acids involved in ribosomal peptides whereas for non ribosomal peptides it can be either standard or non standard amino acids their wish now if you talk about the ribosomal peptides they always have l configuration because all the amino acids are l amino acids they are all l amino acids whereas for non ribosomal peptides they can be either l or d configuration they can either have l configuration or d configuration and yes d configuration where do we find it we find it in peptidoglycan we find it in peptidoglycan where we can see that yes there are d amino acids there are d amino acids in the tetrapeptide found in peptidoglycan also ribosomal peptides are compulsorily linear whereas if we talk about non ribosomal peptides they can be cyclic or linear they can be linear but they can be cyclic as well and these are released by certain bacteria and this is found in all organisms well even in bacteria uh, ribosomal peptides are formed and there are certain uh, non ribosomal peptides and these are basically released in the form of antibiotics and all some antibiotics are made up of they, they actually are non ribosomal peptides so yes now coming to the next and probably the last important part that is physiologically significant peptides peptides that are actually significant to the physiology now here we will be talking about the important small peptides well oxytocin vasopressin these are all hormones and as you know these are released by the posterior pituitary then we have bradykinins then we have glutathione glutathione has three amino acid residues obviously it is involved in redox reactions and the three amino acid residues found in glutathione are e c and g that is glutamate cysteine and and glycine now if you talk about enkephalin enkephalins uh, they are found in painkillers now let's talk about an important commercial peptide well if you talk about aspartame i hope you have heard this name aspartame is found in diet coke like th there is this diet coke where aspartame is added and aspartame has a full like if you talk about the full name it's l aspartyl phenyl meth methyl ester so let's leave this part so aspartyl and phenyl so what does this mean this is made up of aspartate and phenylalanine so yes aspartate phenylalanine forming aspartyl phenyl methyl ester ester so this is how this commercial peptide is present and this is actually sweet this is actually sweet and it is used as a artificial sweetener you've heard about sugar free and all yes there are other types of artificial sweeteners as well like uh, you have sucralose you have allitame and all but yes aspartame is a commonly used artificial sweetener so this was all about important peptides let's finally talk about one important thing uh, which we will actually cover in the upcoming class let's just i just want to leave you with this point this is the peptide bond this is the famous peptide bond now if we talk about the peptide bond what you can see here is something very important there is this lone pair this lone pair will come here there is this partial positive charge partial negative charge this bond will go there and as a result what is formed is co o minus and there is a double bond formed here nitrogen has a positive charge and this has h now what we can see here is that these are the resonance structures 
we can have a resonance hybrid and if we have a resonance hybrid by having this particular skeleton let's say this is static this is not moving but here the electrons are actually moving like this here the electrons that is obviously the electrons are moving like this and what we can see here is this carbon oxygen this carbon oxygen and most importantly this carbon nitrogen bond has a partial double bond character this will have a partial double bond character and this is very important to note because if we have a single bond like this here what we can see is it is free to rotate but whenever we have another bond on top of it even if it's a partial double bond this restricts the rotation and this case of a restricted rotation gives rise to dihedral angles specific dihedral angles some of which are allowed some of which are not allowed and all these things we will be covering all these things in the upcoming session that will be on peptide bond and the important concept of ramachandran plot well do watch the next video and do watch all the videos in this series you already have access to the playlist so this is all for this particular lecture peptide bond peptides and polypeptides i hope you enjoyed watching this lecture if you did Please share it with your friends. Please share this video. Do uh, leave a like. Also do comment your views, your feedback in the comment section. And please subscribe to the channel to stay updated whenever a new video is streamed. So thank you so much for watching. See you in the next video. Bye everyone.